And Iran has handed down its first death penalty sentence to an anti-government protester. The country has imposed a brutal crackdown on demonstrations following the death of a woman arrested for not wearing her hijab correctly. Welcome to the What Matters Today podcast from the Geneva Graduate Institute. I'm Dan Graham, head of communications at the Institute. In this podcast series, we ask members of our faculty to comment on key global issues. This is our second podcast on the situation in Iran. In the first episode, we focused on the hijab, given that policies around dress code are one of the key reasons for the protests in Iran at the moment. We also discussed the treatment of Muslim women in the Western world. In this episode, we look at why these protests have mobilized so many in Iran. We also examine who is actually participating in these protests and the role students are playing as well. Will these protests end up changing Iran? How will all of this end? Will the current regime fall? These are the questions we will examine in this episode. My guest today is Sirus Shayeg, who is Professor of International History and Politics here at the Geneva Graduate Institute. Professor Shayeg, who has a PhD from Columbia University, joined the Institute in 2017. Before joining here at the Institute, he was Associate Professor at Princeton University, and from 2005 to 2008, he was Assistant Professor at the American University of Beirut. His most recent books are the monograph The Middle East and the Making of the Modern World, and the edited volume, Globalizing the U.S. Presidency, Post-Colonial Views of John F. Kennedy. So let's start off by providing some context. Iran has seen some of the biggest protests in years following the death of Masha Amini on 16 September. However, this is not the first time there have been such protests. There seems to be deep-seated anger in Iran over Islamic policies, especially those around dress code. Even when the hijab was made compulsory in 1983, there were protests, which have continued ever since. Why has this latest round of protests mobilized so many? Thanks for the question and thanks for having me here. I think that the answer, first answer, lies in the real multiplicity of factors that drive this protest. Sure, and we will talk about this later, women's issues and the symbolism of those women's issues, including the hijab, are indispensable for driving this protest, I think. At the same point in time, in and by themselves, they may not have unleashed the sort of sustained protests that we have been seeing in the last month. So what are these factors? One, broadly speaking, would indeed be cultural. And it would basically include all sorts of various Islamic state-imposed measures that have affected the life of men and women in Iran, the hijab being perhaps the most visible of them, but um, there are others too. There's some sort of dress code sometimes for men. There is, you know, cultural censorship of one sort or another. One sees this in the cinema, one sees this in music, for instance, and um, related issues. Secondly, and perhaps really importantly, there are, of course, and as you know, I'm sure you know, um, the economic woes of the country. Right. That is not exactly a new problem, that, but rather a long-standing reality that, however, since the 2017-2018 reimposition of sanctions by the United States right. has gathered speed and become worse. The last really rather long, not quite sustained, but also rather long protests that shook Iran in 2019, I think, had actually a lot to do precisely with those economic issues. Prices rose both for oil and for some other staples, and people reacted very vigorously to all of this, forcing the regime in certain cases to sort of revert itself. We will talk later about the reasons for these economic woes. Let me just go straight forward and, you know, now to sort of political issues. And I think, broadly speaking, we can distinguish between two sets here. One set concerns all Iranians. And it has something to do with the fact that the regime in the last few years, peaking last, in last year's elections, has really degraded whatever Republican democratic character and feature the Iranian political system actually did have. 
let me go a little down a little rabbit hole here, historical rabbit hole. The Islamic Republic of Iran has its name not for not by chance. It is Islamic in the one side, which in the Iranian case, in the Iranian case, which doesn't necessarily have to be all cases, but in the Iranian case takes the form of a theocratic system, a theocratic system where certain top election at top officials are not elected, right? While at the same point in time, there are other officials, importantly, the prime minister, the president, and important, uh, well, the, at this point in time, basically the prime minister and, of course, the, the parliament who are elected. And the elections were never quite fair and quite free. That is very clear and true. But in the last few years, they became ever less so. And, um, the, you know, the, the, and, I mean, this was in some ways already true in 2009, which then unleashed the green, you know, uh, movement. But it definitely was true also last year. Um, the elections last year, the presidential elections last year, basically were, were engineered, right? I mean, the people who were allowed to run at all, they're all hardliners of one sort or another. And even the reformists who a few years before were allowed to run, they're not allowed to run anymore. So this is a general political sort of problem, right? And it basically means that you take away a limited voice that people can have within the political system if you do that. The second political issue concerns minorities. And here I don't mean non-Muslim minorities, of which there are very, very, very few in Iran, but rather religious uh, Muslim and ethnic minorities, most importantly Kurds, Arabs and Baluchis, right? And they also have tended to be on the receiving end, not only now, but already in the last few years, and of course before, <laughs> um, of a extra dose of governmental suppression, right? And that now shows in the vehemence with which those protests are supported and actually carried forward and actually started in some ways in the Kurdish areas and the developments, particularly in the Baluchi area. One hears in the news a bit less about the Arab areas in southwestern Iran, but from what I hear and from people who are in the know, there is actually quite a good bit going on there too. So these are cultural, economic and political reasons really sort of coming together, I think, helps explain why this blew and it helps explain why it continues to, to exist. So you mentioned minorities and you mentioned a few very interesting things in that first answer. And so let's take a look at actually who is protesting right now, because it was women that f started the first wave. And, and now what many men have been protesting with women, uh, often shoulder to shoulder. This new round of protests seem to be unifying not just men and women, but also different ethnicities. Uh, some say that these protests are not just about dress code. You've hinted at that, obviously, but about failure to reform. So what are your thoughts on this? While it is very true, and while there are very good reasons that women were at the forefront, women and really, you know, basically teenage girls, not simply women, you know, above the age of 18, let's say, but, you know, also teenage girls, while it is true that um, they were and continue to be at the forefront, you know, of a good number of these protests, I think it is also equally true that men participated in those protests from the very start. And that is precisely because the hijab in particular and state mandated cultural laws more generally that touch women are seen by more and more certainly middle class Iranians as something that is wrong and problematic not only for women but symbolically and in many ways, practically, indicate that the system as a whole is broken, right? That the system as a whole is unjust. So, you know, one has seen this, you know, more or less, um, as it were, you know, from, from the start. So one arena where one sees um, the, the broader importance of, in some sense, in some ways, women's issues, is the arena of gender segregation within universities. Right. So cafeterias that are gender segregated, I think also um, lecture halls that are segregated. And this has been particularly for students, as we're talking about universities, 
has been for a long time an issue and something they have talked against and protested against. And now this is basically all blowing up, right? Um, I should continue by saying a few things about the centrality of students and of high school students in those protests, because I, I actually do think that they are quite important. One thing is, one note will be historical. So without now coming down on or answering the question, is this a revolution or not? I think the judgment is still out on this one. Mm. Simply can't really know. What we do know is that in various ways, organized student bodies, organized student bodies active internationally, were played a considerable, though ultimately not the most central role in bringing about and then leading the 78-79 revolution. And this is certainly something on the mind of students. They do understand and they do see themselves to be part of this longer arc of history and of, of, of activism. Second thing that should be said that concerns students is the fact that this is not a Tehran-centric or even a big city-centric sort of movement or development. This is really something that you see in a good number of really smaller provincial universities as well. And that, in a sense, is ironic because it was actually the Islamic Republic of Iran that from the early 1980s onwards, from the start onwards, opened by its very character of not being modernist, but rather being Islamic, whatever that would mean, opened the door of universities to girls whose parents before wouldn't have wanted them to go. But that now this is, of course, an already older story, right? You're talking about the time that you know, past 40 years ago. So we're talking now about the children and sometimes even maybe children's children of, the, of that generation. But the, in a certain sense, the initial ability of the Islamic Republic to increase social mobility for a good cross-section of the Iranian population has now also created and has, has been creating for, a, for two, three decades um, unintended consequences for itself. So one really sees these student, you know, protests, you know, flaring up time and time again in multiplicity of different cities. Um, and one also, I think, can probably, it, one can, it's probably also true that some of the more high tech um, interventions that we have once sort of, you know, once in a while seen, like hacking, you know, live TV programs and things of that sort are probably run by you know, tech-savvy student, right? And one should probably say that even more than already in under the late Shah, the Islamic Republic, for various reasons, has really succeeded in building up a really impressive sort of, you know, university system that, you know, keeps feeding scores of, you know, uh, students uh, who, you know, go abroad and sometimes stay there and sometimes come back. So the thing, though, is that it's not only students who protest, right? It is also other types of actors. And I think the most important, there are two most important other types. One is industrial laborers. And here what one sees is not so much a sustained sort of mobilization and a sustained action, the same workers time and time again protesting in the same sort of um, establishments, although in some cases this seems to be happening too. Rather what one sees is sort of a strike here, then a strike there, things of that sort. Which means, this is quite important, that now, at that moment, there isn't a explicit alliance yet, an organized cooperation yet between students and laborers. And of course, for a revolution, if this would become one to succeed, organization is really quite important, right? The second other type of actors are exactly the ones that we talked about before, namely, you know, those minorities. And of course, these are overlapping categories. So they are Kurdish students, for instance, right? And they are Baluchi laborers, for instance, right? And here, I think at the moment, uh, the sort of the two that stand out at the very least in terms of their visibility are the Kurds and the Baluchis. The Kurds simply because they have been probably protesting as much as, if not more, than any other sort of region in Iran. And it's actually quite impressive to see 
that they succeed in continuing to persist despite and then with the regime uh, repression. And I do think, but don't know for sure, that some of these you know, Kurdish actions are inspired, at the very least, by what Kurds have been managing to do and actually accomplished in northern Iraq and in northern Syria in the last 15 to respectively 7 to 8 years. And I think this is a really important, really actually important backstory to what's going on that we will hear about much more in the future. I do think that if Massa Amini would not have been Kurdish, I'm not so sure whether the same thing would have happened, right. to put the long story short. Right. right. And I think this is really important because, well, precisely because we do think of Iran, particularly in the West or outside Iran, but, you know, certainly in some ways also Iranians themselves, Persephone, Shi'i Persephone Iranians, do think of Iran really very much through the prism of the Persephone Shi'i sort of community, right? But it really is much more than, as it were, only, entre guillemets, only that. The Baluchis, it's a bit of a different story. There are cross connections to Baluchis, of course, in Pakistan, but there, that community using sort of a regular yardstick of, you know, thinking about tradition and whatever modernity or progressiveness is much is not really progressive. They're actually quite traditional, everything else being equal. And you see this also in, well, in some ways, you see this in the fact that the uh, basically leader, the, the religious leader of the, um, of the Baluchi community there is, is a very is sort of important figure, right? And the regime is actually in some ways indirectly negotiating with him, yeah, which it is not doing with others, right? right? Simply because he is a... Yeah, a, a quite sort of powerful figure. Whether this will continue or not, that's a separate question. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you for that. You, you mentioned regime oppression. So let's just talk a bit about that because Iran seems to be using every effort to crush protesters and stop a potential revolution. In fact, Iran just issued the first known death sentence uh, linked to these protests just a few days ago. So this might be a hard question to answer, but how do you think these protests will change Iran if they do at all? And, and how do you see this ending? Will the regime fall? I, I know, as mentioned earlier, I don't think that we can tell this yet. What we can say, though, is the following. Even if the regime succeeds, succeeds in repressing what is going on now, it will pay in different ways for the consequences. One consequence, particularly if this goes on for a much longer time, might be a sort of a larger or perhaps smaller schism within the regime itself. This may not matter too much because the people who may distance themselves from the regime are anyway those who presently are more on the margins, namely precisely those sort of reformists. So it may actually not matter that much for the regime, but, you know, you never know. And secondly, you know, regime legitimacy... <laughs> For whatever it was still worsened, you know, in whatever it still, you know, uh, you know to, what, to whatever degree it still existed, will, will, will suffer even more. And that will have all sorts of different consequences. It also may simply mean if suppression, if repression succeeds, it may simply mean that at this point, some people will start to go underground and start to get organized better, which is, of course, something that, you know, sometimes happens in cases of this sort, and then just wait for the next round. And then actually really go for it, right? I do think that at the moment, it, let's put it like this, if the protests continue the way they are right now, which means you have multiple, but ultimately quite distinct and separate communities protesting, you have some minorities, you have some laborers once in a while, and you have students. If it continues like this, there is no coordination between these, then I'm not so sure how much success it will have. But it can, it can drag the regime down, right? It, the longer it goes, the more problematic it is for the regime. Too. So I think that's sort of, you know, what we, need to, what we need to think about. You mentioned sanctions in the first answer. I think it's impossible to talk about Iran without talking about sanctions. So the EU is looking to impose more sanctions on Iran in response to the country's use of force against peaceful protesters. The first round of sanctions imposed travel bans and asset freezes on specific individuals. Now this new round would see, and I'm quoting, 31 designations for human rights violations that would target individuals and entities, end quote. 
Now, do these type of sanctions actually have any impact? Can they help change the situation in Iran? Not immediately and directly. I think, though, that if the sanctions would not happen and if nuclear negotiations would have continued as is, protesting Iranians in Iran and their backers outside of Iran would have been flabbergasted. And in that sense, these sanctions, though, practically speaking, rather unable to really hurt the regime, send a certain message to protesters that, you know, certain important countries in the world, certain powerful countries in the world have their backs. And I think that matters to people. And um, some Iranians, particularly Iranians outside, close to circles of power, have actively encouraged European and American and, you know, some other Western, you know, politicians to make moves of this sort. Great. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for joining us for this episode. Thank you. That was Professor Shayeg discussing the current situation in Iran. This podcast series is produced by the Geneva Graduate Institute Communications team. For more information about the Institute, please visit our website at graduateinstitute.ch. I'm Dan Graham. Thanks for listening.